Welcome to Highbrow Lowbrow, the show where our podcast hosts Steve Paul and Dan Slattery pit high art against low culture. In this episode, we look at two films which are both marvels of narrative cinema and also landmark works and technical innovation. Steve's choice is John Huston's twisted melodrama, Reflections in a Golden Eye, a film which was originally released in an old gold color palette. Dan takes a look at Searching, a film for the internet age where all of the footage is taken from social media accounts. Do these experiments in cinema work? As always, dear listener, the final decision is up to you. Beware spoilers. Enjoy the show. Well, good evening once again, dear listener. Thank you for joining us. This week, we're looking at two films that take an innovative approach to storytelling. I'll be examining searching later on. But first of all, here's Steve with... Reflections in a Golden Eye. Thank you, Dan. Yes, my choice, my highbrow choice for this week's episode about innovative storytelling is John Huston's 1967 adaptation, Reflections of a Golden Eye, which is based on a novel by Carson McCullers, which is a seminal text in the Southern Gothic genre. And this is probably one of the best Southern Gothic films. It is set at an army fort somewhere in the Deep South. And in the opening credits, we see a quote from Carson McCullers, the author or the authoress, which says, there is a fort in the South where a few years ago, a murder was committed. So right away you're hooked. Uh, it's always good to start a story with a murder because then you think, hey, who, who did it? How are we going to solve it? But the story itself is much more of a melodrama. At this army fort, Marlon Brando plays Major Weldon Penderton, who is a repressed homosexual whose wife, Leonora Penderton, played by Elizabeth Taylor, is a bit of a sex kitten. And they have a marriage made in hell because he can't come to terms with the fact that he's gay and she is very sexually confident voracious he, he can't satisfy her she's actually having an affair with his best friend lieutenant colonel morris langdon played by brian keith that they live next door to each other on the fort langdon's wife allison is played by julie harris who gives i think a really standout performance here she was a noted broadway actress Alison Langdon is suffers from severe depression. She mutilated herself after the death of her child. The description of the mutilation, which I'm not going to give here, but it will absolutely raise the hair on the back of your neck. This is quite a wicked and twisted film. So you have the two married couples who, in their own way, there's adultery between them, there's, there's cheating and whatnot going on. Alison Langdon's best friend, the only person she really trusts, is a Filipino houseboy called Anna Clito, and he was played by a Filipino actor called Zorro David. Brando is being cuckolded, but he's not so much bothered about the fact that his wife is having an affair. He becomes sexually obsessed with Private Williams, a soldier in his charge, who he, he first meets when he's ordered to go around to the house and Private Williams's job is to kind of clear away some foliage. I should say that this army fort, there seems to be on absolutely nothing going on. This is a depiction of the army, which has become fat, bloated. It seems to completely lack a role. And it was interesting that the film came out at the height of Vietnam and the novel was published during World War II. But the army fort itself is barely mechanized. You barely see a car. They're actually all keen equestrians. There are stables on the fort, which are seminal to the story, pivotal to the story, I should say. And because Elizabeth Taylor takes great pride in her favorite horse, Firebird, a stallion. And there's some very, very pointed imagery in this when she tells her husband, you know, Firebird is a stallion, i.e. you're not. They do a lot of riding together, and there's even um, a cocktail party later in the film where they're talking about the importance of playing polo in giving men leadership qualities. So the, the portrayal of the army is just absurd, deliberately absurdist. Part of Brando's sexual uh, obsession with Private Williams is that w Williams looks after the stables, 
and he has a kind of special relationship with, with all of the horses. Williams is described by his fellow soldiers as a virgin, and he gets a little bit of teasing for that. And of course, there's big symbolism here, because where you are, say, in your life sexually, whether you're maiden or, or married or an adulterer or a cuckold or gay or straight or, or whatever, the characters are more like symbols than actual people. But Williams likes to take out Firebird and ride him, barebacking. <laughs> he's completely naked. And Brando spots this one day when he's out riding with his wife and his wife's lover. And he verbally disapproves, but you can tell that he's growing increasingly obsessed uh, with Williams. But there's a lot of nakedness in this film because Elizabeth Taylor, at one point, to taunt Brando, strips down completely naked to show him what he can't have and then walks very slowly upstairs and as it happens Williams is passing the house and sees her through the window he gets a glimpse of her in the raw and becomes sexually obsessed with Elizabeth Taylor or her character I should say Leonora Penderton everybody's kind of obsessed with somebody else someone who's not obsessed with them it's, it's kind of like lots of misdirected sexual desire going on the plot is rather slight but it is full of this kind of wickedness, which is just absolutely kind of delightful to watch and heavy, heavy symbolism. For instance, Marlon Brando is a very bad horseman, but he tries to prove himself. He takes out Firebird and he wants to see Private Williams naked, which he does, but he can't control Firebird because Firebird's such a stallion. And then he's thrown from the horse and then he whips it. He really gives Firebird a, a good beating. He savagely beats it. He goes back to a cocktail party. He's in a terrible mess. And when Elizabeth Taylor finds out what he's done, to Firebird, she whips him right in front of all of the officers who were all, you know, sipping their martinis and everything. And he just stands there motionless while he's, he's getting a good thrashing. The symbolism is down in the title as well, because Anacleto shows Ellison a painting of a golden peacock. And he says, like, the world is just a reflection in this peacock's golden eye. Now I'm going to segue a little bit into talking about the production because the original cut by John Huston had this kind of golden hue to it. And you're really just seeing a kind of like a drained of colour, kind of golden yellowness with the occasional love of colour. For instance, it might, you're looking at a screen that's entirely gold, but you might see a red rose. So you see a little bit of other colour. And that was how the film was released. And it played for about a week. But a lot of audiences didn't respond well to it, and the studios were apparently horrified. They re-released the film with a kind of, you know, normal colour palette, you know, a multi-colour palette. The theatrical version looks kind of muddy. It's kind of got lots of earth colours, greens and browns. I've seen it as the theatrical cut, and I've watched certain scenes because it was finally in 2020. There was a Blu-ray release of the Golden Cut, if you might want to call it the Golden Cut which was Houston's intended version. So more than 50 years later, we finally got the film that John Houston wanted. Of course, he's long passed away. But it's nice to think that we can finally watch the film as he intended. And it does look spectacular. It was shot in a former US Air Force base in New York State. But it was also shot at Dino De Laurentiis Studios in Rome. Apparently, this was to comply with Elizabeth Taylor's jet set lifestyle at the time. You know, she was at the height of her marriage to Richard Burton and they were the most famous couple in the world. The cast is excellent. Taylor originally said she'd only do it if they cast Montgomery Clift as her husband. Her Montgomery Clift was her co-star in Suddenly Last Summer, which is a film that Dan has talked about on this show, and I think it's a film that has a lot of similarities to this one. Clift was very unwell at the time in pre-production, and it was difficult to insure him, and Elizabeth Taylor put her fee up as insurance. But then he died suddenly, and Marlon Brando took the role. But I think Brando is really, really good. He'd had a string of turkeys, so he was beginning to lose some of his uh, golden sheen, no pun intended, with American critics and, and European critics. But this was something of a comeback film for him. He's, he's, he's really good in it. I think it's quite brave of him because you think of him in films like Streetcar and Name Desire and On the Waterfront and Guys and Dolls. And in, in the 50s, he was just like probably just one of the handsomest actors and he was every woman's dream man. And by this time, he's starting to put on weight and he's playing a gay man. His only false note is probably his accent. <laughs> it's not great. You know, he's an Italian-American actor, 
playing a born Korea soldier in the Deep South. He goes for a Deep South accent and he misses it and he somehow creates his own accent, <laughs> which is unlike any accent I've ever seen before. But it doesn't bother me. It's kind of it's kind of mildly amusing. But the whole film is, is a little bit of a pantomime, it's a very, very wicked pantomime. You kind of enjoy that side of it. The same with Elizabeth Taylor. She, she was, you know, the most beautiful woman in the world, the most desired, sexiest woman in the world. And she still is very sexy. And the scene where she strips down to a birthday suit is very effective. She was starting, you know, to put on a little bit of weight and she, she looked a little bit past the best. It looked like both of the leads had, were suffering a little bit from too much good living. But they're really good. So is Brian Keefe as Langdon. Julie Harris, I mentioned. Zorro David, uh, the Filipino actor, was interesting. He actually became a painter in later life. And that's interesting because his character paints the pivotal painting of the story. And it was the film debut of Robert Forster as Private Williams. He had some success on Broadway, and I think maybe he'd done a bit of television, but it was his first film. And what, <laughs> what, uh, what a way to start your film career, having to ride around naked on a horse, which I imagine probably hurt a fair bit. But, he, you know, he's very good in it. And he became, on the back of this, quite the countercultural star of the late 60s. He was in another famous countercultural film called Medium Cool, which is on my list. I haven't seen it yet. A couple of others. And then he kind of disappeared. He, he fell into kind of exploitation films, some straight to video. He wasn't working that much. And of course, then he had a big comeback in Jackie Brown, thanks to Quentin Tarantino, who has arranged a number of Lazarus-like comebacks. And Jackie Brown's one of my favourite films. And Robert Forster is brilliant in it, as the bail bondsman Max Cherry. He won an Oscar nomination for that role, and then he worked consistently until the end of his life uh, a few years ago. So, you know, it's a melodrama, it's Southern Gothic. You know, I've watched it at home, but I was reading Roger Ebert's review when he saw it in the cinemas the first time round in a golden tint, which he said the audience quite liked. But it was also a strange movie going experience because it, we said it was like musical or, or something because there was hooting and hollering and there was just insane laughter that you'd usually associate with a, a National Lampoon's film or something, people were rolling in the aisles laughing because it is so deliciously wicked and over the top. I did feel like on the second viewing, towards the middle, I began to think, well, the story is a little bit slight, but, you know, I love the, the kind of lurid, sleazy aspects of it, the meanness of it, and it does dovetail back to the quote, the Cosmo McCullers quote at the start, that there is a fort in the South where a few years ago a murder was committed. We do have two character deaths, both of which are very suspect, arguably whether they are murder or not, but there are two pretty dramatic deaths. I think it is a really interesting and enjoyable and certainly very memorable film. A couple of things, Dan Island, who was a director himself, and first introduced me to this film because Dan Island was a Trailers from Hell commentator, and that's where I first saw this film. Worked with John Huston on John Huston's last film, The Dead, an adaptation of a James Joyce short story. Even though you, you're not really supposed to, when you work with someone famous, you're not sp sp supposed to ask him about, you know, the films. Which one was your favourite? He said, well, he said he couldn't resist. He's like, I really like your film, Reflections in the Golden Eye. And Houston was delighted. He said, that was a film I think I got everything right which kind of threw Ireland because it wasn't considered one of John Huston's best, like, you know, the Maltese Falcon or Fat City or, or you know, Night of the Iguana. Or, 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 I mean, Houston had such an eclectic career, the man who would be king, whichever whichever ones you like, you usually make about a film a year. But apparently he rated this as one of his best. And I haven't read the book, but apparently it is a very literal adaptation of Carson McCullough's writing. And she died just a few weeks prior to the film's premiere, so she never got to see it. I'm recommending it to you now. I think there are very few films like it. Uh, I think the whole thing is a hoot, and it's very enjoyable and bizarre. I'm here to make kind of highbrow choices, and I guess this being kind of Southern Gothic and very off the wall, I think it's a pretty good highbrow choice, and uh, I commend it to you. Reflections in a Golden Eye. Well, dear boy, I'm so glad you brought up Marlon Brando's accent so I didn't have to. That, for me, was one of the big clunkers in the film. I thought, I know he's one of the most talented actors on the screen, but that accent is just shocking. Yeah, you dreadful. <laughs> Dread it is, it is, it's dreadful. Interesting that Montgomery Clift was Taylor's original 
proposal for her husband being the fact that the husband's a closet homosexual and of course Clift was a closet homosexual at the time. Mm. That would have been an interesting juxtaposition to see on screen. As I mentioned, when I was doing Sydney last summer, it appears Taylor was always incredibly protective of Montgomery Clift, even on the shooting of Suddenly last summer and then anything else that she did, trying to get him involved to try and help his career. So it's to her eternal credit that she put her foot down and wanted him cast. Would he have done a better job than Brando? Who knows? I think his performance might have been slightly more understated. For me, Brando sometimes lies it on a bit thick. Not so much in this one. Apart from his accent, I thought everybody in that cast acquitted themselves rather well. Yes. I only watched it in the Golden Tint. I didn't watch the originally timed version. I was reading, like I say, the Roger Ebert review. Roger Ebert did say, since the film was photographed in full colour and the fading for the Golden Tint was done in post-production, most of the video versions have simply restored the colour. The thing to do is use your colour adjustment to fade the colour to almost but not quite black and white. Does it work? That's for you to decide. I have to say, watching it with a Golden Tint, I could see why it was done as an artistic choice, but having the whole movie that way and basically flattening the dynamic range of the colour palette did make it rather dull after a while. I thought it could have been used in certain scenes, like with certain characters as a kind of signifier, but to just blanket the whole film that way, after a while it made it for rather dull viewing. So I can see why the studio probably went back to the movie as it was shot on film. But also in terms of social media, these days the message could get out really quickly, like the film's meant to look like that. You know, whereas at the time people would go to the cinema and saw the film was all yellow. Was there some problem with the film? Whereas now the message could be transmitted a lot more quickly. No, it's meant to look like that. Stop complaining. (laughs) Yes. Having watched the theatrical cut, the colour palette is actually quite good. I mean, like I say, it's very earthy, green and brown, which kind of suits because, like I say, it seems like it's one of these army forts where time has just passed by. Hmm. It's not a modern army. It's not an up-to-date modern technological force. They're basically all cavalrymen. And there's references like Elizabeth Taylor's an army brat. And they're all career soldiers. So they've done this all their life and they don't know anything else. Martin Scorsese said there's a scene where Brando is talking to himself in the mirror because he thinks he's he's a lecturer and he thinks he he gives lectures on leadership. And there's one hysterical one where he just breaks down midway through. (laughs) He's talking about pattern and then, but then he breaks down because he's in love with this man. He's practicing his lecture in the mirror. And Robert Forster's outside, looks in and sees him. But that scene apparently inspired the Travis Bickle mirror scene in Taxi Driver. You know, you talking to me? Which is one of the great famous scenes. Another one is in Apocalypse Now, when they were filming that, Coppola was actually horrified at how fat Brando had got when he arrived in the Philippines. It's like, you're supposed to be a special forces colonel. So they use still photographs from this film. Reflections of the Golden Eye, as part of Colonel Kurtz's um, military record, which Martin Sheen examines at the beginning of the film to get a sense of the man he's sent out to kill. When you finally see Kurtz at the end, they very carefully shoot round him. He's always in shadow. He's always, you, you never see his belly, you only see his, his head and stuff. And when Scorsese says things like that, it helps the reputation of the film to grow. I put it as one of my favourite John Houston's, And I'm not just saying I don't like everything John Houston did. I mean, far from it. I mean, I love The Man Who Would Be King, but everybody seems to rave about Preachy's... Is it Preezy's Honour or Preachy's Honour? And that film just leaves me cold. Oh, is, um, that the, is that the Jack Nicholson, Kathleen Turner one? Yeah, and, and his daughter as well, Angelica Houston. Uh, no, I saw that, and like yourself, I thought, this yeah. is the guy who did The African Queen. No, it didn't do it for me at all. But, you know, it's the room. Somebody liked it. <laughs> yeah, somebody liked it. If, you, if you're if interested in Houston, I'd recommend Clint Eastwood's uh, White Hunter Black Heart, in which Clint Eastwood plays a director very heavily modelled on Houston, filming The African Queen in Africa. It's basically what happened on the set of The African Queen is that they go out and Houston in the film, Clint Eastwood just becomes completely obsessed with big game hunting and the film almost falls apart. It's a miracle it was made. White Hunter Black Heart is, is a great, great film. If you know the whole Houston persona, you know, the, the cigar and the, and the kind of, well, kind of rusty voice uh, and, and the kind of cackling laugh, that film gets it pretty well. I just thought Eastwood was playing himself. There's parallels between the two men, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
like we were discussing with Kane previously, there and there's another man with the filmography a mile long with a fair degree of clunkers in it would be Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Maybe at some point we should do an Eastwood special. Yeah. Yes. Although I'm not going to do any which way but loose. No. Can't, no, can't, can't recommend no. that. Sorry. No. Yeah. No. No orangutans. No, no orangutans. No. Sorry. I mean, I, I even I even I have to draw the line somewhere. So <laughs> No, I enjoyed Reflections of a Golden Eye. At first I thought, oh God, is this going to be really melodramatic? And then once I got into it, I really enjoyed it. And even with, you know, the experimental colour tint, I thought that, yeah. So a good recommendation. I do suggest you go and seek it out in whichever colour timing version you prefer. The recent Blu-ray has both versions on it for you. <laughs> so you can see what kind of mood you're in. Are we in a golden mood tonight? Or a <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, earth or golden, yeah. No, Bond fans obviously notice Golden Eye in the title. And of course, um, Fleming's residence being called Golden Eye. Any merely coincidence or any linkage between the two? Well, I hadn't planned this in advance, but now that you mention it, I think Houston was one of the directors on the very bad spoof Casino Royale. Ah. And he certainly got a part in the film. But, oh, you're talking about the Fleming residence in Jamaica, Golden Yes. I, d I don't believe that's that's pure coincidence, yeah. Because oh. the novel was published in 1941, and, and no one knew who Fleming was then, so. No, I mean, did Fleming take the name for the residence from this novel or from the film? Did he think, oh, Golden Eye, that's a good oh. name. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know where Fleming got the name, yeah. So, so no, I don't know. Yeah, it could have been the other way around, yeah. Or it could have been some op that he worked on, you know, that we, we will only find out when certain things are declassified. Who knows, Steve? Possibly, possibly. You know, there is a link, I think, in terms of, you know, because Fleming's books and when it's come out in some of the movies is that he's rather obsessed with s &M and torture, particularly torture of the um, sexual organs. And, and obviously there's a lot of symbolism in this with, you know, thrashing and uh, barebacking and, and that sort of thing. So who knows, maybe it was a Carson McCullers fan. Right. Oh, well, there you are. Interesting linkage there. Yes. Yeah, so when you did say about torture, the, I thought, yes, that scene in Casino Royale, hmm, which made me squirm in my seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Arch. Just make sure there's not a hole in the seat below you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's arch. Arch. And on that bombshell, yes. <laughs> shall I crack on with mine then? I, I, I think so, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Lead okay. on, Dutch. Okay, thank you very much. So my choice this week is the 2018 film Searching. Now, it comes from a genre known as screen life or computer screen. It's one of the first to be filmed as if you're looking at a computer screen. And that's basically how the film works. If the story is told through a computer screen, through social media footage, through websites, through webcams. It's quite innovative in that storytelling device. It's about a father called David, played by John Cho, who's probably better known to some of you as Sulu in the more modern Star Trek films, or if you've watched Harold and Kumar Get the Munchies, then he's Harold and that. I haven't seen it, so I can't recommend it. But I, one of these things, I thought, I know you're facing somewhere. And IMDb gave me the answer to that one. David and his daughter seem to have a healthy relationship. His wife, Pamela, died before his daughter, Margot, entered high school. One night she calls him, but he's asleep. The next morning he can't get in contact with her, but he thinks she's gone to her piano lesson after school. So he calls the piano teacher, but Margot cancelled the lesson six months ago. He then discovers that the money that he gave her to study these piano lessons has been going into a account on Venmo, which has been deleted. He calls the police to report a missing person and has signed a detective, Rosemary Vick, that's played by Deborah Messing, who Will and Grace fans will know pretty well. Then it all develops from there. Margot has developed fake IDs. Detective Vick shows traffic camera footage of her car. And it's basically one of these films that plays into every parent's nightmare where the kids are more technologically savvy. Is that what have they hidden? John Cho plays David as this adult discovering the technology and discovering what it can be used for, both good and bad, and discovering the secret life that his daughter has hidden so successfully from him. He plays it so well, and watching him discover it as we discover it as it plays out on the screen, I imagine a lot of you listening to this, if you have children of a certain age, and I'm sure it has crossed your mind when they're using the PC, just what are they getting up to? And this film taps into that primal fear 
how easy it is to create a whole new identity on social media and possibly to hide it. Now, this was at a time, 2018, when all social media was just really kind of beginning to take off and all these things were possible. Now, we're all a bit more knowledgeable about what can and cannot be achieved and how you can do things like this. But certainly at the time, I think it did tap into a certain ignorance that one generation had of social media compared to the next. And how David, the dad, thinking that all is well, what looks like a missed piano lesson, suddenly becomes something more sinister. It also shows footage of David going onto a streaming site called Ucast, which is pretty much YouTube by another name, and meeting people in Margot's other life there and investigating them. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give away the twist, but... Some of the twists are slightly obvious, but part of the fun is the way in which the story is told. We find out things just as David finds them out. So in a way, I thought this is getting back to like Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler. We only know what Marlowe knows. We don't have any uh, knowledge beyond that. There are a few incidents, I think, where we're, if I remember correctly, where we're kind of given a quick heads up just before David finds out. But most of the film, we're finding out just as David finds out and we're drawing the same conclusions right or wrong about certain things that he is there's some suggestion that there's something going on between his brother peter and his daughter Margot, and just as he fears the worst so do we so there's enough twists to keep you going um it is pretty much a standard missing persons inquiry film but the way it's told is what makes me recommend it and it's like i said the genre is called screen life which is the genre of visual storytelling where all the events are shown on a computer, tablet, or smartphone screen. It's one of the first, it's, you know, there's been lots of ones done afterwards. The same team did a sequel just this year. A spiritual sequel came out called Missing, which tells a similar story. And it references back to this one, but you don't need to have seen this to see that. If I talk too much about the plot, then I'm going to give away many of the kind of little discoveries that are made, little, many of the little devices that David comes across in his investigation and the footage that is used. But I saw this on a small screen and I was sitting there thinking, I wonder how this would have played on a big screen because there's not much music in it. The camera work is quite static in that you're looking at one thing, although you are seeing many different camera feeds coming on the screen. So there is a bit of activity, but you wonder how this would have played on a big screen. Would it have worked? Or is it because it's shot as a screen life thing? Should it be watched on a similar screen? I enjoyed watching it on my computer monitor. I thought it worked really well, and it certainly kept me intrigued. Didn't see the resolution coming at all. I thought there were enough twists and turns to keep you going. At no point did it re ever really seem to be running out of steam. It takes a while to get going. I warn you now, it does take a while, and you think, uh, but then once it starts, it just keeps drip feeding you, does new discoveries. Watching it now with the benefit of hindsight, knowing what can and cannot be achieved on social media, you sometimes think, you're kind of waiting for David to catch up, but you've got to understand, you've got to put yourself in the mind of somebody of his age in 2018 when it was younger people were kind of getting into the social media lark and a lot of parents weren't and didn't understand the potential threats of it. Like I say, it plays very much into, I'm sure, very primal fear. I'm not a parent myself, but I have a nephew and niece and can see where the filmmakers were coming from in this one. And I'm sure there were probably were a few viewers who maybe went home and checked their child's search history. Who knows? I do realise I've kind of, I haven't sold it very much, but then the, the story itself is quite simple. What is uh, interesting here is the actual way in which the story is told. The rest of the cast aren't really names as such. You may recognise a few faces, but certainly John Cho and Deborah Messing are the two leads that I recognised when I started watching this. But the rest of the cast equip themselves admirably, and the plot is well written. And it does utilise the screen telling format very well. This wasn't the first type of screen life film I'd seen, Steve. Was this the first screen life genre film that you'd seen? It was the first genre film, yeah. And I was very impressed with it. I made reference just when we were chatting before the recording. There is a Netflix documentary about a real life murder that happened in Colorado. A man killed his wife and two kids. And they managed to put together so much footage of social media as well as cop 
body cams and video doorbells and everything and they put together a whole full-length documentary on that case just from that kind of assorted multimedia footage and it's very very good i like this i didn't know anything about it going in and I'm, i don't know if someone somewhere botched the publicity because i'd never heard of it and uh, i imagine it could have been a hard film to sell it's kind of very hard to describe because you hadn't explained the plot much to me. I, I, I first switched it on, and then you see the mother falls ill and dies, and suddenly the husband's a widower, and he's, he's got to raise a child himself. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a, a drama. Is this going to be like Terms of Endearment or something? But then it evolves into something kind of more sinister. There were just one or two moments where I thought, like, maybe the cop, Deborah Messing, wouldn't be talking to him by phone or video camera or stuff. There's one or two conversations where that would take place some, mm-hmm. somewhere else, but I, I thought it was good. And then it just shows you how we're all living so much on grid these days and be careful of social media and not just to avoid harm to your person, but just to, you know, if you say something ill-judged, that's going to affect your career or n- nothing on the internet is truly deleted. So, which he finds out to his benefit because things that are kind of hidden away that his, his daughter wouldn't have wanted him to see. He manages to dig up after she's missing. That's what starts to put it together. No, I really enjoyed it. For me, watching it as well, it's an education is, like you say, just how much data we all generate and just how much of it stays, even when you think you might have deleted it all. If you know where to look, you can find out anything really about anyone. And this is something that David learns eventually that he then finds out where to look and can get the information he needs. But then you wonder as well, it's one of these things, the more he finds out about his daughter's secret life, the less palatable it all is. And it's like you're being led down this rabbit hole. Where will it end? And will you like what you discover? For me, as a screen telling format, like you're saying, you do need to make some compromises to keep it visual. Uh, I take your point about that conversation with the cop. Would it have been done on the camera? Probably not. But then I suppose you could have had a graphic of a sound wave for them having a telephone call but I suppose because it's all in one thing you've got to keep things kinetic you've got to keep some kind of energy and therefore you've got to keep bombarding the viewer with visual information to keep them entertained so that they don't think all I'm doing is looking at a computer screen but I take your point sometimes you need to suspend realism slightly to benefit the storytelling but I thought they kept it all very real you know, technology-based films you, you see, certainly in the 80s, where you think there's no way you could do that with technology then, there's no way you can do it now. Everything you see on the screen was doable at the time and is doable now. It just shows how far technology and filmmaking equipment has come, really, that you can do something so small scale and still make it look so good on the big screen. Unfriended is one I've seen, and that's quite good. There's one called Host, which is another screen life one. And then there's a whole load of them, like, um, what's the word? Fine footage, like the, whenever the Blair Witch Project. Yeah, you know, the, everybody did one. The first one listed here is Thomas and Love in 2000. Megan is Missing from 2011. VHS, which is like an anthology one. I didn't realise it was in the screen life genre, but it is. And then there's a few others, some that are still to come out, Secret Scene, and quite a few short films as well. And Can I recommend one which is kind of slightly pre this it was described by its director as an internet drama because it was uploaded in episodes onto youtube yeah the louise paxton videos the official title is in the dark but it's probably just known as louise paxton videos it's about a woman who moves from norwich to london you know so first time in her life is is she in the big city and it seems like she's having the time of her life and she's filming everything on phones or on camcorders this is about 2007 so not so much phones but candid footage and then slowly she's being stalked and she creates a video diary she's afraid to go outside she's hearing noises in the night and she's becoming increasingly paranoid a lot of people fell for her at the time because it was uploaded onto youtube youtube was fairly new it was very well done as a brilliantly performance by an actress called zoe richards who i had the good fortune to inter- interview I also interviewed the director, Andy Cole. Uh, they're both, you know, fabulously talented people. And it's quite good. Yeah, the Louise Paxton videos, a bit ahead of its time. And that may well have been what scuppered this movie, was that it was slightly ahead of its time, that people weren't quite ready for the screen life genre. You could see maybe why it might have been a difficult one to market, but I enjoyed it very much. Once you get over the limitations of the storytelling format, and as long as there's a good script and good actors to drag it along and the plot keeps moving along, then I think these things work really well. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. If you did like it, I do recommend you search out Missing from this year, which is the same idea. 
same kind of plot, few differences, but rather than an adult coming to terms with technology, it's been missing. It's a young girl who knows the technology coming to terms with adult life. And I think it makes reference, if I remember correctly, to this film, but it does the none of the characters actually appear in it. What's that one? Sorry, let me write that down. The Louise what videos? I just call them the Louise Paxton videos. If you Google that, you'll okay. find them. But the official title is In the Dark, but I don't think that title ever quite took off. First of all, because when they were being uploaded, a lot of people fell for the hoax, and therefore In the Dark is just a title that's kind of been added on. Yeah, they are very good. Oh, there we are. Somebody's done it on YouTube. In the Dark Week pattern, a.k.a. Louise is Missing. There's another name that's been stuck on it. Somebody's done a playlist. About 37 videos I can see here, all running between three and ten minutes. Yes, my first vid, my last night in Norwich, my new flat, my new... St- and then weird camera movement. I Must Be Mad is another one. Terrifying night. Oh, looks rather fun, dear boy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a nice jolly... Well, I could just, yeah, I'll probably watch this after we've recorded this, to be honest with you. But yes, they're all on YouTube for you, should your interest be just as peaked as mine has been. Thank you for that. No, not at all. I imagine that you can probably do them. Maybe the appeal is you can do them on a quite tight budget. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's one of the things I'm reading about it here. It's done using things like Zoom. If you or I were doing one, one of us would be holding the camera while the other was playing to camera. You can record it on the same device that you're actually having the thing. You can use other software to populate the screen. And the turnaround apparently is quite quick. So I think then you are relying on the script being very good and the story being enough to carry through the limitations of the format. Same with fine footage. This is why some of them work incredibly well, because the script is tight, uh, whereas others, they've gone into thinking, let's make a film of this genre without actually hammering out the script. Just looking for financial data on searching. It was made on a budget of $700,000 and it made $75 million worldwide. So it did quite well for itself. Oh, good. But, yeah, and the Unfriended earned $64 million on a $1 million budget. Like anything, it relies on having a good script. And if you have a terrible script, then you're going to have a terrible movie. Then again, you could have a great script and still have a terrible movie, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's always sad. If you've got a great script, the trick is not to let somebody else screw up the external forces. Well, dear listener, I hope you've enjoyed our two choices for this week's episode, Reflections in a Golden Eye and Searching. They're both technically innovative films far ahead of their time, and I hope that you search them out and enjoy them very much. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. You've been listening to Highbrow and Lowbrow, presented by Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery. We'd love to hear from you, and you can contact us by going to our link tree. That's linkpr.ee forward slash Highbrow, lowbrow. Until next time, keep it highbrow and lowbrow.